Hi everybody, my name is Jimmy Carroll. I'm the Vice President of Operations at Tech B2B Marketing. I'm here at SPIE Photonics West 2024 doing the Manufacturing Matters podcast. I have the pleasure of being jo uh, joined today by Noel Moore of um, Sustainable Photonics and obviously my colleague here, John Lewis. No, thanks so much for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Great to be here. Thank you for the invite. Of course. So for those who don't know, could you tell us a little bit about Sustainable Photonics and what you do there? Yeah, absolutely. So Sustainable Photonics is a, a relatively young company, about a year old now. And what we've tried to do is approach the concept of sustainability within the photonics industry, not only from a manufacturing point of view, but from a supply chain point of view, and then from a customer intimacy and relationship point of view. So engineering the relationship to be sustainable, not only looking at it in terms of traditional sustainable manufacturing. Mm -hmm. How did the company uh, come to be? How did you, you, you started it with a partner of yours, right? How yeah, that's right. My, myself and my partner, Ken Faree, started it. And the idea was really to, to try and fill in some of the gaps. For example, if you look at sustainable manufacturing techniques in other industries, they're very well adopted. You know, electronics, semicon, automotive, these guys are world leaders. Those industries are starting to adopt products from the photonics and optics sector. And the supply chain in photonics and optics, generally speaking, is not up to those quality and manufacturing standards as, as much as their customers need them to be. Okay. So traditionally, in photonics, it's photonics people selling to photonics people, and everyone understands performance. But now it's more about, for example, automotive supply chain quality control, or, for example, the medical device industry quality control. Um, and so, therefore, starting to think more like being a sustainable partner for your client rather than just thinking internally. Mm, okay. Yeah, one of the things you said uh, was really, uh, it made me think, uh, uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, sustainable relationships, um, could you talk more about that, just to clarify for me? What you uh, mean by absolutely. That? You know, so, so if you, th you think of the traditional sales process and the sales engagement, you know, it's potentially adversarial. People are trying to get to a deal that makes sense. And, you know, a lot of people historically, the, the old fashioned way of looking at that is almost like win lose. It's, it's almost a zero sum game for some people. But the truth is, that doesn't work in volume applications. Um, you can't have that mindset when you're partnering, for example, with automotive or consumer electronics, because they will mandate you to have a cost down of X percent, and it can be significant, five, 10 percent per year after contract is signed. So you may, you know, you may have a platform and a manufacturing infrastructure that can get you the order today, but it will put you into the red in 18 months if you're, if you're going to volume. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about what does that sustainable relation relationship look like at the outset of the discussion. And it's not just about getting the order, it's about customer satisfaction, and not just your customer, but their customer. Mm -hmm. And maintaining the relationship Ex over time. Exactly, and frankly, having the relationship uh, be about something more than just price or performance. Um, like for example, our partner Day Optics, who we're here with today, uh, at Photonics West, they're probably leading the way in terms of building sustainability into their business model. They have multiple sites, they have redundancy in their production, and then they've deployed a lot of new technologies which are quite new to our industry, very familiar in other industries, but new to photonics, with a view to having a sustainable partnership with many of their very, very large clients. Mm. I, I want to ask some questions about your, your partnership with Day Optics because obviously you're here with them this week and, and that, that suggests that this is a major partnership for you guys. But um, a couple other questions I wanted to ask first. So in terms of general trends in the photonic space, what, what are some notable ones and how do those impact some of the challenges you might encounter when it comes to sustainability? Yeah, so again, it's just to, to, to revert back to what I said earlier, we're moving as an industry from you know supplying uh, either a component or a device to now being a manufacturing partner. And it really is a case where you're entering into contracts where the end user consumer market dictates everything for all the supply chain partners. So it's not something where at the outset, you can say, look, here's a price that we're going to commit to for five years because the market dynamics, for example, in automotive, a good example would be automotive LiDAR. You know, deployment of automotive LiDAR has not reached the heights that people thought it would, yet many companies have built that capacity. And they have to hold and ride that capacity and try fill it elsewhere if they can, 
until that wave comes from LiDAR. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the same if you're talking about wearable devices, uh, you know, or uh, AR, VR. Uh, a lot of times the fundamental manufacturing capacity is there and it has to be ready to scale up because when one of those big companies, you know, the consumer electronics giants, when they deploy a new mobile phone or a new, a new tablet or whatever, they're not planning to sell a few hundred, they're yeah. planning to sell a few hundred million very quickly. So you may go from prototype stage, which could only be in the thousands, to suddenly being asked to deliver 10 million a month or 50 million a month or whatever else the, uh, the market will sustain. Mm. Mm. Okay, so in going into day optics, uh, a lot of times on this podcast, we, we're talking to, for the most part, manufacturers or, or you know software companies. But you work with companies in a different way. So using using day optics as you know a primary example, how do you how do you work with your partners? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So um, I, I suppose we would try to come at it from both ends of the spectrum. Like if you imagine the market awareness and and customer intimacy as let's say the closest to the final customer and then maybe you imagine the R&D side of your company as perhaps the closest to fundamental science. So what we try to do is we try to come at it from both directions. Uh, we try to have very, very meaningful and impactful discussions with customers which then allow us to roadmap where the current capabilities of a company like Dayoptics are, what we can do with them today which is about building trust, it's about building relationships, it's about proving yourself to be a reliable and sustainable partner, but then it's also about having that confidence of discussion with your partners at many, many touch points in their organization where you can become part of the, the, the not just the design win process, but in my opinion, Day Optics is, is becoming a designed to win company. And what I mean by that is, we all think about we have a product that's designed in and, and we're safe, we have that order for some period of time. What Dayoptics is doing is it's looking at the fundamentals of its business from a manufacturing point of view, from customer relationships, supply chain, uh, and sustainable power and so forth. And it's, it's looking at these things with a view to having a roadmap which is expanding in terms of breadth and depth of the uh, interaction with the customer. So in practical terms, they're actually absorbing and, and removing risk from their customer by doing and adding value add services uh, that customers are not as competent at doing as day optics. A great example, many, many wonderful uh, optics manufacturers here today, e even just from China, I think there's 160 companies, wonderful numbers. However, what Day Optics is doing is it's offering levels of integration to move up the value chain, which is not about taking the, uh, the customer's business away from them, it's about de-risking their supply chain. So they're bringing in modules that are pre-tested, performing at a very high level, and with a very, very low variance you know, in the millions of products. So that's something that people value and they place a premium on that relationship. Hmm. You had mentioned that uh, some of the sustainability efforts involved, uh, you know, AI. I know that's a very uh, hot topic in manufacturing these days. A lot of manufacturers talking about how they use AI. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, it's it's probably one of the most bandied around terms at the moment, and, and there's probably millions or billions of dollars being won and lost in the stock market day by day with you know the hashtag AI. Um, but put simply. What Day Optics are doing as an example is a very, very intelligent approach to it. It's uh, using AI in a very secure manner, not necessarily only in a generative way, but in a comparative way. So in ter to give you a specific example of what I mean, in terms of, you know, if you look at final quality control, the safest place to be is right before you dispatch to your customer, right? That final stage of quality control. But Day Optics is a little smarter than that. What they're doing is they have an inline quality control process with a, a pass or no pass very, very early on in their, uh, in, their, in their process. So to give you an example of how this matters and how it matters to the bottom line is, you, let's say, for example, you create an optic and it's not a good optic. Well, then don't waste your time cleaning it, polishing it, coating it, and packaging only to mm. find at the end that we have a problem. So what Day Optics is doing is, uh, and it has a, a couple of different modalities, but very simply, 
they have done a, a reference lookup AI scenario where they compare uh, several data points, you know, can be something very simple like visual, but can also be something like performance, so a metrology type thing. Mm -hmm. And they look at that and compare it in real time so they have the feedback information to the manufacturing process. So instead of just you know, having uh, quality failures and, and, and rejection rates at the end of your, your production uh, uh, architecture, what it allows you to do is catch devia deviations early in your process, correct them, and therefore not have money going to scrap. So why is it important? Well, it allows them to be more competitive, it allows them to be more efficient. You, you know, in, in a case like Day Optics, um, it is not about cost down in terms of their product, it is about quality control up. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's, that's in some ways it's counterintuitive, but they do go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. By not adding value to a, a flawed optic, for example, <laughs> exactly. you know, they're, they're Conserving resources, yeah. not wasting. Yeah, exactly. You, you, yeah. you don't yeah. you don't cook out of date uh, food. You know, you yeah. uh, you throw it throw out, it so away. you don't waste the, the energy and the process on doing it. And it's the same thing here. Yeah. So that what that leads day optics to is, uh, it's a very very high pass rate in the in the optics and, and electro optics that they make, and that is a necessary door opening, if you want to go to med tech or automotive or consumer electronics because those guys don't tolerate a 10% failure rate or a 1% failure, it's, it's not the way. Mm -hmm. I always appreciate a good uh, analogy, so I like that. <laughs> uh, in terms of the general space, Noel, are there, what advice might you offer a, like a new or even an aspiring company in the photonic split? You know, are there, have you seen repeat mistakes from startup companies or companies looking to get into the market that you say, hey, be sure not to do this or be sure to do this? Yeah, and like I, I think probably the number one thing, and we were talking about this at the uh, Global Business Forum here at SPIE, SPIE yesterday, our industry has gone through a few waves, even though we're a relatively young industry, like for example, the telecom bubble in 2001, and then the, uh, the great financial crisis in 07, 08, 09. And a lot of things that uh, our industry uh, have probably learned the hard way is about committing capacity too early and having an overcapacity in the industry. The example I would give you is, in the last couple of years, there have been uh, a lot of consolidation activities in the LiDAR space. Mm -hmm. And a lot of very good companies with extremely good technologies have failed due to having overcapacity for a market that isn't ready. So one of the things that, one of the ways to overcome that is, uh, and Day Optics does this very, very well, it looks at fundamental architecture that can serve multiple industries. Mm. And sometimes they're cyclical together, sometimes they're anti-cyclical. So ideally you'd like to have a little buffer where one industry is perhaps performing very well and one maybe not so much, but that you have a surge capacity. And again, um, you know, Day Optics is actively investing and expanding in, in new facilities. And they're doing that partly to have additional surge capacity, but also to insulate themselves from supply chain shocks. Uh, you know, we're not so far past the pandemic, and uh, companies like Day Optics, many got wiped out by being closed down. With Day Optics, what they have is they have geographically diverse locations, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but it does give you insulation against shocks, you know, uh, earthquakes, uh, you know, whatever, but it also gives you shocks against um, let's say man-made phenomena such as energy shortages, water shortages and so forth. So, you know, the idea, for example, with day optics, they don't choose a location based on something like labor cost, that, that's foolish. In the modern photonics industry, if you choose a location based on labor cost, that just means your automation level is incorrect. Mm -hmm. So what you should be doing is looking for areas that have sustainable energy costs and, and low energy future costs, that they have uh, security of supply around water, that they, um, of course, a workforce and, and these things, they, they all come into it. But it's, it's a multivariable complex decision-making process. And Day Optics is, is actually doing this in a very aggressive way to ensure that if there's a disaster at one location, like a COVID shutdown or something like that, they can just pivot the capacity elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a nice way to insulate against shocks. Mm. 
John, anything from, from your end? That you well, I, I was uh, thinking of the Global Business Forum. We were there for part of the day yesterday, and I, we saw uh, Dr. Bo Gu's presentation on China. And uh, you know, it was uh, one, one of the things that really struck me was the amount of uh, renewable uh, green energy that China has been investing in in the last few years. Yeah, and it, you know, again, there's um, like there's if you saw it in that forum yesterday, there was there was a in some ways there was a reluctance to embrace the fact that China is the biggest player in photonics, and a lot of parties at, the, at that event were, were you know kind of looking at how do we protect our businesses and so forth. The truth is, you do it by collaboration. Um, and you, you do it in such a way that you have sustainable partnerships with Chinese companies. Um, the geopolitics aside, it's, it, that, that's fine, it, it is what it is. But what we have in China is we have an ecosystem which is able to, is super agile. It's able to pivot very quickly. It's able to invest very deeply and very heavily. And it's able to capture applications in a, in a very, very holistic way. Um, in a way that, you know, uh, not other places in the world can do it, not at that scale. Mm. Just, just a kind of a general question because I'm curious and you have a, a unique company and a unique background, but any advice you'd offer a salesperson that's new to the photonics industry? And I ask that because, you know, some people, if they come from an entirely different space, might have a certain approach to sales. Whereas here, you know, in photonics, sales and marketing are, have to be done a little bit differently. You're talking to a different audience. Do you have any any general advice for that? Yeah, actually, we, we um, in sustainable photonics, I'm sure this wasn't a planted question, but <laughs> in sustainable photonics, we do offer a sales training course um, for people who are in photonics, but maybe they've come from a scientific or engineering background. We call it the reluctant salesperson. And what it is is, you know, the, the level of technical knowledge you need to have in the photonics industry is a little bit deeper than in some of the other ones. Uh, and it can be, you know, it's, it's myriad. There's very, very uh, deep niches that you need to know about if you're in that space. But what we've done is we've, we've kind of put a process in place that suits engineers and scientists in how they follow logical processes. So to look at the sales process, not necessarily as an adversarial thing, but as an optimization to a converged solution. And that's something that sits very well in the mindset of people in our industry. Uh, but in terms of the advice that I'd give them, the industry has changed a lot. So 10 or 15, 20 years ago when I started, it really was PhDs talking to PhDs and everyone was speaking the same language. Over time, that evolved and it was PhDs speaking to business people. That's where we were five years ago. And now we've moved forward. And a great example would be Day Optics and how they're handling this challenge. The current dynamic in the market is it's photonics companies talking to deep applications experts in a very narrow field. So for example, it could be a photonics expert who's expert in optics speaking to somebody who's going to be deploying this in a medical device. You could be doing that on a Monday. And then on Wednesday, you could be talking to somebody who's doing an aerospace communication project. By Friday, you could be talking to someone who's doing automotive LiDAR. So knowing your product and knowing your company and your competitors is fantastic. But knowing the concerns of the end users and how their industries are shaping their pressures is something that I would advise people to pick up. Mm. How do you do it? Honestly, you listen to podcasts like yours. You, you get on and, and you look at what are the dynamics in those industries? What are people talking about? Uh, a lot of themes do emerge. Sustainability, security of supply chain, um, you, you know, these kind of things. Innovation is always there. Uh, so I would encourage people to know their own company well but to know their, their uh, customers even better. Sure, yeah, makes sense. Uh, let's see, John, anything else to add? Or Noel, anything that we, we haven't talked about today that you're passionate about, excited about? Yeah, look, I, I think the future is, um, we really are at an inflection point in photonics at the moment. So specifically, we are about to see mass market deployment in a way we've never seen photonics before. You know. We all have photonics in our cell phones and our, our tablets and our laptops, whatever. But if you look at the new emerging world of, you know, you think of photonics as looking at things with light, but now these devices are looking back at us with the same light or with other light. So for example, you know, you imagine something like driver monitoring in a car, you know, it's monitoring you for tiredness and so forth. We're very, very close due to things like uh, photonic integrated circuits. We're really, really close to having 
wearables and and consumer products like vehicles and, and tablets and and you know smartphones which will be essentially real-time wellness applications for us as well. So looking at things like your hydration levels, your oxygen saturation in your blood, your blood glucose level, um, you, you know, other stress-related uh, you know, metrics that they can look at. Um, one of the things, and again, day optics is very, is very, very um, strong in this. If you look at some of those applications, they tend to need a large bandwidth in terms of wavelengths, so many, many different colors, and they maybe need many different sources or many different collection points. So there's a broad range of modalities to look at, a lot of data to pick up, and what you end up with is you end up with a ton of data with the use of AI where you can really uh, optimize experiences for people. And I think we're just about to see that in the next five to 10 years really explode. Interesting. Yeah. Anything, anything else, John, to add? Or no, I, I mean, I, I was checking out the Day Optics website the other day, and you know, I don't know much about them, but I, I, there were some, um, there were some uh, kind of bullet points that jumped out under their technology, like optical coding, manufacturing, and bonding technologies that seemed kind of unique to me, and I don't know if we could talk a little bit about them or not. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I tend to look at Day Optics portfolio in terms of utility. So they would start, I would say, from planar optics. These can be things like windows, and everything that has a photonics component these days has a window. But sometimes that window could be for protection, but sometimes it could be for filtering. So maybe, for example, you want a very specific wavelength or color of light, and you're not interested in everything else. So um, you know the flat optics that the optics produces, filters and, and windows, uh, but then things like mirrors and so forth and, and wave plates are all part of how that light is harnessed and captured, uh, both delivered and, and retrieved in terms of uh, many, many of these products, you know, as, as simple as lasers and as complicated as, as communication systems. But then the optics has moved up the value chain, uh, both in the complexity of the optic, but also then in their level of integration. So, you know, when we, we talk about optics, you, you imagine, you know, pieces of glass or crystals, but then the next stage up is electro-optics, where we have, you know, some sort of an electrical device, for example, a piezo, which creates a, a sound wave across a crystal, and that's used to control the light in some way. And the optics are masters at this. They're, you know, it's new products for them, recently developed, but leading the industry in terms of performance. It's shockingly fast uh, delivery to customer needs. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of the metric. You know, they're, they're delivering a lot of products at the integration level that their customers are requiring. And I think what you'll see over time, and I think the optics is a little ahead of the curve here, uh, you will see the commodity optic market like all commodity businesses, is a race to the bottom in price. But by adding higher and higher levels of integration, what it does is it allows the, the OEM customers to move up the value chain because they're de-risking the supply and functionality that they're buying in. And people are very happy with that if it's done in a controlled manner. You know, even where IP might be developed somewhere else, Day Optics is able to contract manufacture that in such a nice and, and, and reliable and a sustainable way that it's very much aligned to the roadmaps of these very large companies. Noel, if people want to learn more about sustainable photonics, is it just sustainablephotonics.com? Sustainablephotonics.com is there, and myself and my partner, Ken Faree, and myself, Noel Moore, we're on LinkedIn. Easy enough to find, and happy to, to reach out to anyone and just have a chat and, and love hearing new things. We love hearing problems and love solving problems. Yeah, right on. If anyone has uh, questions too, they can. We're, we're happy to take them and pass them on to Noel and his team. Uh, it's uh, manufacturing-matters.com. If you have any general questions, comments, want to join, or like I said, have questions for sustainable photonics or, or day optics, uh, please do reach out. And thanks everyone for watching or listening. <laughs>